Welcome to this whole life action hour. I am Ocean Robbins, your host. And today we're going to talk about blood sugar. We're going to talk about diabetes. We're going to talk about how insulin works and about what kinds of foods set you up for healthy blood sugar balance and a long, healthy, vibrant life. To give this a little bit of context, more than a third of all Americans, more than a billion people worldwide are either diabetic or pre-diabetic. But even if you have some form of diabetes, there are ways you can master it. And in many cases with many types, you can even reverse it. So today we are here with Cyrus Kambata, who is one of the world's leading experts on this topic. He is the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Mastering Diabetes, the revolutionary method to reverse insulin resistance permanently in type one, type 1.5, type two, pre-diabetes and gestational diabetes. And Cyrus has been living happily with type one diabetes since 2002. He's the co-founder of Mastering Diabetes and he's an internationally recognized nutrition and fitness coach. He co-created the Mastering Diabetes Method to reverse insulin resistance in all forms of diabetes. And he's helped more than 10,000 people to improve their metabolic health using nutrition, intermittent fasting and exercise. Uh, Cyrus, it is such an honor to be with you today. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your book. Thank you for your leadership. And thank you for your wisdom here with us now. Yeah, thank you, Ocean. I, uh, I absolutely appreciate you inviting me to be here. And uh, I'm here to provide whatever value I can possibly provide. Fantastic. A little bit of context for everybody who's with us. This is a project of Whole Life Club, which is Food Revolution Network's uh, ongoing membership community. Some of the questions that I will bring in today come from our Whole Life Club members. I also want to be very clear that nothing new here today is medical advice. This is coaching. We're sharing our best insights. But of course, you should always consult with a qualified healthcare professional about your specific medical issues and needs. That said, this is coaching and you're going to learn a lot today. So welcome. Uh, Cyrus, let's jump in here with a quick explanation for those who don't know of type 1, type 1.5, and type 2 diabetes. How are these similar? How are they different? And what do those numbers mean? Okay, cool. Yeah, so there's, uh, I like to think of their different types of diabetes as being different flavors of diabetes, if you will. Okay, so um, there's, the scientists used to believe and medical professionals used to believe that there were two types of diabetes, type 1 and type 2. But it turns out over the course of time that there's actually a, a larger number of different flavors. Now there's type 1, there's type 1.5, there's pre-diabetes, there's type 2 diabetes, and there's gestational diabetes. So that's five different types. And then in addition to that, over the past 10 to 15 years, researchers have actually found that there's a new type of diabetes called type 3 diabetes, which is actually cognitive decline and or Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So now we have type 1, 1 1.5, pre-diabetes, type 2, gestational diabetes, and type 3 diabetes. So six different types. So to make sense of it all, the simple way to think about it is we're going to classify it into one of two groups. You either have autoimmune diabetes or you have non-autoimmune diabetes. Those are the two classifications. The autoimmune versions of diabetes are type 1 and 1.5. And that's, I am, I'm living with type 1, and I was diagnosed with type 1 in the year 2002 when I was 22 years old, which is actually a late diagnosis for type 1. Generally speaking, uh, people are diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in, in the, as an infant or in their adolescence. So anywhere from like, you know, 6 months old all the way upwards of 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Okay? And the reason uh, that type 1 diabetes sets in at a young age is because it's an autoimmune reaction in which the beta cells inside of your pancreas, which are responsible for secreting insulin, have been compromised. And the scientific community doesn't fully understand what the reason that type 1 diabetes sets in in the first place is. Like, There's no way to pinpoint one cause of type 1 diabetes because there's actually many different causes of it. Um, and as a result of that, uh, you go from being able to produce a, what's called a physiologically normal amount of insulin to help regulate your blood glucose values. And that, that hundred percent insulin production capacity goes down to 60%, then 40%, then 20%. And before you know it, within about a 12 to 18 month period, you go down to 0% production of insulin. And that's a big problem because insulin production is so important 
not only for blood glucose management, but for literally thousands of different metabolic reactions, that when your insulin production is compromised, it sets off a global uh, metabolic disaster in a way, or global metabolic uh, dysfunction, which can then lead to uh, dysfunctions in many other tissues. So that's type one in a nutshell. Type yeah. 1.5 diabetes is type one diabetes that happens to set in at, after the age of 30 in adults. And it's just a slower progressing version of type one diabetes that may never end up in full insulin dependence. Okay. Then you have the non-autoimmune versions, which is pre-diabetes, type two diabetes, and uh, all um, gestational diabetes. And the three of those are actually a collection of symptoms that originate from another condition known as insulin resistance, okay? So what ends up happening is that you, over the course of your life, end up developing insulin resistance via your diet, via your lifestyle choices, via the amount of exercise that you do or don't get, and via um, your overall lifestyle. Now, when you develop insulin resistance, if that insulin resistance is not, uh, is not handled, is not reversed, it can then progress into prediabetes where your blood glucose becomes a little bit elevated. And then when your blood glucose is a little bit elevated in the prediabetic state, you can then develop type 2 diabetes where your blood glucose is significantly elevated. And then at that point, it requires medical intervention. So uh, those are the two types. Prediabetes can turn into type 2. And then when it comes to gestational diabetes, that's a form of insulin resistance that affects women who are pregnant. And gestational diabetes is thought to be a temporary condition in which it shows up during pregnancy and then it disappears as soon as the mother delivers. Except there's one caveat to that, which is that women who live with gestational diabetes, even if it does disappear after they deliver, end up at a significantly higher risk, a 60% higher risk for the development of type 2 diabetes in the future. So we have to think about gestational diabetes as, as being very important to reverse during pregnancy. And when you do that, then you can drastically decrease the chances of a complication during pregnancy, complications to the infant, as well as a uh, reduce your risk for the development of type 2 after pregnancy. Thank you. Very thorough and very in record time. Thank you, <laughs> Cyrus. Uh, I think you've talked about this before and you do it so clearly. Uh, it seems to me, if we step back for a minute, that all of these have one thing in common, which Correct. is that insulin isn't getting the job done, Correct. whether it's because there isn't enough being made or because the body isn't able to um, be sensitive to it and utilize it properly Correct. with the result that blood sugar goes up too high, right? And yeah. it's the insulin brings it down and how it's a sort of buffering effect that Right. that helps it to stay at the right level for optimal you, you we want some blood sugar in order to have the energy we need to burn but a flood of it it's kind of like i guess like a car engine that if you put down the gas and just flood the engine you can't even start the car because it's just flooded with gas there isn't enough oxygen in that case exactly. can you tell us what happens when blood sugar is too high and uh why that's a problem yes it's a very good point okay so if we take one step backwards here and try and ask ourselves, well, what, what is insulin and why is it even necessary in the first place? So I mentioned earlier that insulin is produced by the beta cells in your pancreas. And uh, the beta cells in your pancreas, so you, you can think if I, if I handed you a pancreas, the pancreas would be, you know, maybe like you know, the size of like two palms of your hand or so. It's a sort of like amorphous tissue that doesn't really have a shape or a structure. Now, this pancreas, 99% of that pancreas or more has nothing to do with insulin production. 99% uh, of that pancreas is, uh, secretes uh, digestive enzymes that are required um, in order for you to properly metabolize the food that you eat. The other approximately 1% of your pancreas is responsible for manufacturing insulin. And those cells that manufacture insulin are called the beta cells. Now, the beta cells are highly, highly specialized cells. In fact, they're so specialized that if you lose the ability to manufacture or secrete insulin, uh, it is an irreversible uh, effect, meaning that if you go from having a, a normal beta cell mass to a you know, reduced beta cell mass and reduced insulin production capacity, uh, modern science has no way of reversing that to get you back to normal insulin production. So it's a very important effect. Now, insulin, like you mentioned, insulin's job is to bring your blood glucose down. So you can think of it this way. Insulin goes and knocks on the door of your liver and muscle tissue primarily, and it goes, knock, knock, there's glucose inside of the blood, do you want to take it up? 
And your liver and muscle cells can respond in one of two ways. They can either say, okay, sure. Thank you for the message. I appreciate it. Let me open my doors and allow glucose to come inside. That's option number one. Option number two is for your liver and muscle cells to say, no, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. I can't listen to you. I choose to close my doors to you. I am not open for business. And as a result of that, uh, glucose cannot come inside of these cells. So normal glucose metabolism is designed in such a way that when insulin knocks on the door of your liver and, uh, and muscle and says, hey, knock, knock, there's glucose in the blood. Do you want to take it up? Both of those tissues are supposed to respond by saying, okay, great. Sounds like a plan. And they allow glucose to come inside. And that enables your blood glucose to be nice and stable over the course of a 24-hour period. Okay. Now, your blood glucose is supposed to be between 70 and 130 milligrams per deciliter. That's the sort of measurement of it. So, Ocean, you don't have diabetes. If I were to test your blood glucose at any moment in time within a 24-hour range, uh, approximately 99% of your life, your blood glucose will be between 70 and 130 because your pancreas and liver are talking to each other and they are making sure that at all times your blood glucose is within that range. Now, for someone like me or somebody who's living with prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, uh, the amount of time that they spend out of that range, either lower or higher, goes up. And the reason, again, is because there's a compromised ability to either manufacture and secrete insulin or to utilize insulin. So in the case of insulin resistance, when insulin doesn't work as well, what ends up happening is that insulin knocks on the door, says, hey, liver, muscle, do you want to take up this glucose? And those tissues respond by saying, hey, listen, I would love to take up that glucose. I really would. But here's the problem. There's so much triglyceride inside of me, so much accumulated fatty acids that have accumulated over the course of many months to years that I have to first burn this stuff and get rid of it first. Once I do that, I can then open my doors to you and allow glucose to come inside. But before that happens, I can't do anything. So as a result of that, insulin tries to knock on the door, say, hey, would you like to take this glucose up? Both tissues respond by saying no. And then glucose has no, no choice but to remain inside of your blood. And when glucose hangs out inside of your blood in excess over the course of time, your blood glucose begins to rise. So instead of being between 70 and 130, it becomes 150, 180, 200, 220, 290. And before you know it, you now have excess glucose inside of your blood that can then go aggravate every single other tissue in your body. It aggravates your eyes. It aggravates your kidneys. It aggravates the nerve endings inside of your fingers and toes. It aggravates your brain. It aggravates your thyroid gland. It aggravates your liver, you name it. And so over the course of time, when you have elevated blood glucose, and that persists for days, weeks, months, and years, tissues throughout your body become dysfunctional and it can lead to tissue failure, which can then cast, you know, result in a whole collection of problems. So a lot of people think that certainly for type two diabetes, which is the most prevalent form, that uh, it's, a, it's a symptom of excess blood glucose and therefore, we need to look at where we make glucose from, which of course would be sugars, right? Or carbohydrates are most readily converted to glucose. So Correct. typically then they say, okay, cut down on the carbs if you want to bring down your glucose levels. And sure enough, people who are checking their blood sugar level who are diabetic or pre-diabetic will often find that if they eat sweet things, their blood sugar goes up a short time later, right? Because that's Correct that's turning into glucose very quickly and their body doesn't know how to process it properly because of the dynamic you just described, insulin sensitivity being lacking. So, um, so then they cut down on the carbs and sometimes, at least in the short run, they don't have that problem anymore, but right. they have some other problems, but they don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, I think you are also saying that that's not root cause. Correct. And uh, so tell us what is root cause? Okay. It's a great question. So this is part of the reason why I think diabetes is, uh, can become overly complex because there's many variables and you can manipulate these variables and you can get many different results. And it's easy to come to the wrong conclusion. All right. So the, the conclusion that you just presented, which is what the majority of the diabetic population experiences and the majority of uh, doctors and medical professionals also experience is that when they tell their patients to lower their carbohydrate intake, 
and lower their quote unquote sugar intake, then when people do that, well, guess what happens? Their blood glucose comes down. Their blood glucose is more controllable. Their A1C value, which is just a marker of, you know, three month average blood glucose, that comes down. And their overall, what's called their glycemia improves, right? But what, what people don't realize is that, just like you said, that is not treating the root cause. That is treating literally the symptom of high blood glucose, right? If you really want to treat the cause of type 2 diabetes and the cause of prediabetes, you have to ask yourself a simple question. What is the cause? We talked about that earlier. The cause is insulin resistance. So then you say, fine, what is the cause of insulin resistance? And the cause of insulin resistance actually is not sugar, okay? Now, I'm going to take a side note here real quick. I don't like to use the word sugar because sugar is a very confusing word, okay? So yes. people use the word sugar, I think, uh, a little bit too liberally. And as a result of that, they get confused, all right? So when when people refer to the, the the stuff inside of your blood as blood sugar, they're making a mistake. And let's not talk about blood sugar. Let's talk about blood glucose because glucose is actually a fuel for your liver, for your muscles, and for your brain, all right? So I want to use the word glucose because that's the most biologically accurate word to use. Now, the, the reason why sugar is not the right word is because sugar is a white crystal that is created from the result of a manufacturing process. You start with a sugar beet, okay? Or you start with sugar cane and you process that, you crack it, you grind it, you mill it, you, you end up with a white crystalline substance. That sugar is a sugar that causes metabolic dysfunction inside of your liver and muscles and sexual organs and brain and vasculature, you name it. And as a result of that, we know as a society that eating sugar, which is actually considered to be refined sugar, is a very huge problem. And as a result of that, it actually increases your risk for many chronic diseases. So we have to get away from uh, eating more sugar and adopting that inside of our diet, okay? Now, the reason why I wanted to bring attention to that is because people think that sugar is what causes insulin resistance, but it's not a true statement. What causes insulin resistance is actually the excess consumption of and the excess accumulation of dietary fat. And this is a huge epiphany. It's a huge aha moment for people who are living with diabetes because most people have never heard this before. Most people are unaware that their dietary fat intake has anything to do with their blood glucose because they've never been educated about this. But if you go into the research and you spend thousands of hours actually reading research papers to try and figure out, well, what does dietary fat do? What you'll find is that when you consume dietary fat, it goes in your mouth, it travels down your esophagus, it gets inside of your digestive system. Inside of your small intestine is where uh, triglyceride, which is the form that fat is uh, eaten in food, triglyceride is then, is then ripped apart and the fatty acids, multiple fatty acids are then absorbed into your blood. Those fatty acids are then circulated inside of these particles known as chylomicrons, okay? This won't be on the test, don't worry about that. But these chylomicron particles basically uh, have a job and their job is to distribute these fatty acids to tissues, okay? so. If these chylomicron particles went only to one tissue and one tissue only, which is your adipose tissue or your fat tissue, okay, and delivered fatty acids into that tissue and delivered it absolutely nowhere else, then diabetes would not be a problem. There would, there would, the rate of diabetes in this world would be very small. We wouldn't even be talking about it today. But here's the problem. These chylomicron particles, they deliver fatty acids to your adipose tissue, your fat tissue, okay? Your fat tissue is everywhere. It's inside of your neck. It's inside of your armpits, it's inside of your abdomen, your butt, your quadriceps, you name it, right? It's that tissue that nobody really likes and everybody wants to get rid of, okay? It turns out that your adipose tissue is actually a safe place to keep fatty acids because it's mechanically and enzymatically designed to absorb fatty acids when present and then to get rid of those fatty acids when, they, uh, when there's a need to get rid of them. Yeah. But the problem is that these chylomicron particles deliver fatty acids to your adipose tissue and they deliver fatty acids to your liver and they deliver fatty acids to your muscle. So when these fatty acids get inside of your liver and muscle, they are capable of storing a very, very, very small amount of fatty acids. But if you're eating a low carbohydrate diet, because that's what your doctor told you to do, what that means is that you're technically eating a high fat diet. So you, you, as a result of that, if you're consuming more cheese and red meat and white meat and fish and olive oils and even if you're doing it from the plant-based world and you're eating more avocados and nuts and seeds and oils 
what ends up happening is that the amount of fat inside of your diet gets so large that those fatty acid particles end up in your adipose tissue where they're supposed to be, but they also get inside of your liver and muscle in excess. And that's the problem. When there's too much of them inside of your liver and muscle, then those tissues, again, they go back to what we did earlier. They have a difficult time saying no to those fatty acids. They don't have a mechanism mm -hmm. for it. So the fatty acids come inside. And then the next time you eat something carbohydrate rich, like literally one banana, right? Or maybe a bowl of quinoa, mm -hmm. even if it's a whole carbohydrate and the, the glucose from that carbohydrate is then trying to seek a home inside of your liver or muscle. Insulin comes, knock, knock, there's glucose in the blood from the quinoa, would you like to take it up? And your liver and muscle say, I'm sorry, I can't do this, I'm closed for business. Did you see all those eggs and bacon and red meat and white meat and avocados that came in before? There's a traffic jam inside of me right now. There's too much fatty acid. I have to get rid of this stuff first before I can accept glucose. So this is what the, the problem of insulin resistance is. Hmm. It's excess lipid that then creates a metabolic traffic jam that makes it so that glucose is not absorbable. Yeah, thank you. Uh, to put it in overly simplistic terms, I think of it a little bit like um, uh, that if you're driving and you're getting speeding tickets, you know, which let's say that's sort of like your blood glucose is too high. Okay. You could, right. you could stop driving, which is like not eating carbohydrates. Right. Uh, and then you won't get any speeding tickets. Right. Right. Uh, and if you don't drive ever again for the rest of your life, then you'll have solved that problem. You won't get any more speeding tickets, but you might actually become a worse driver because you're not practicing and you're not addressing the issue that made you get the speeding tickets in the first place, which might've exactly. been bad driving. And so then you're actually a danger on the road if you ever go out there because you're not practiced, right? And so it, or maybe speeding tickets isn't the metaphor, maybe accidents is a better metaphor. But the point is, if, you're, if you don't practice it, you won't risk, but you also won't gain the competencies to do it well. Absolutely. And yes, for somebody who is a really dangerous driver, they'd better get off the road until they get some lessons, you know? And right. if your blood glucose is too high, you better cut down, especially on the simple carbs that can elevate it while you deal with the issues because you've got an urgent issue, right? And, right. but at the same time, dealing with that deeper issue is creating the conditions by which the, uh, the cells can absorb the glucose <clears throat> and do what they're supposed to do, which is to absorb it and use it, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, okay, so Good fascinating. Enough. So now let's talk about type one for a minute, which is what right. you're dealing with uh, in your life. And right. you know, a lot of people talk about type two, but type one is a real thing. And there's a lot of people that have that as well as well as 1.5 now, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So how does, how does lack of insulin production play out here? And how does that relate to what we're talking about today? Okay, great question. So we talked about the fact that insulin is a problem, whether you're not manufacturing a significant amount of insulin, which is the case in type one and 1.5, or whether you do manufacture enough insulin and it's just not utilized well inside of your liver and muscle, okay? So in the case of autoimmune diabetes, type one and 1.5, it's an insulin production problem. So the beta cells have been compromised and they're either at you know completely dysfunctional, meaning you secrete zero insulin, or they're manufacturing a small amount of insulin, which is not biologically relevant. So the only true solution for living with type one or 1.5 diabetes is to supplement with insulin, okay? There's a lot of people who try and play the low carb game and they say, okay, hold on a second. If I just avoid carbohydrates completely, then I can keep my blood glucose nice and flat, right? And then that will at least keep my time in range better, right? Which is generally speaking a good thing. But you're sort of playing with fire because in an insulin compromised state, uh, like we said earlier, insulin has so many metabolic responsibilities mm -hmm. that uh, even if your blood glucose is flat, but you're insulin deficient, that can limit tissue growth. It can limit... Uh, RNA production, DNA production, DNA repair, uh, fuel storage, you name it. There's, there's many different uh, biological processes that are requiring insulin. So you don't want to play that game. Instead, what's necessary to do is to communicate with a medical professional. They'll give you a prescription for insulin. You then have the responsibility of using insulin and injecting the amount of insulin that your pancreas would have otherwise secreted if you didn't have insulin. So you're basically just supplementing for what your pancreas can no longer make, right? Now, the, the one caveat that I will say to this is that 
in the world of type 1 and 1.5, uh, you know, if I told you, Ocean, you have to start injecting insulin as of tomorrow, right? We're talking about a life-changing event, mm-hmm. completely life-changing, right? Because what you're going to have to do in order to become comfortable in injecting insulin is you're going to have to start to figure out, well, what is the, you know, carbohydrate and fat value of my food, right? Mm-hmm. And how much of that food am I eating for breakfast and then for lunch and then for dinner? Because you're going to have to inject before each one of those meals. And then you're probably going to have to take a different type of insulin called a basal insulin, which gives you a drip irrigation over the course of 24 hours. In other words, there's a lot of things to think about, right? Yeah. So many people who are given the prescription to, in, to inject insulin um, are afraid. I was afraid when I was first diagnosed. And it's, a, it's a definitely a very challenging time of life. And the goal, the, the sort of idea is, okay, I'm going to inject the smallest amount of insulin humanly possible because that's going to be a better outcome than if I gave myself too much insulin, right? And the idea is, yeah, you, you don't want to under-inject insulin. You don't want to over-inject insulin. You want to inject the right amount of insulin because that's actually what's going to make you uh, control your blood glucose nicely and then also to lower your risk for chronic disease. So there's a whole orchestra that you have to learn in order to figure out how much insulin to give yourself. But the idea here is that carbohydrate avoidance is not the solution even if you have to inject insulin, even though that's the predominant narrative in the world of type 1 and 1.5. So um, you, I believe, need less insulin because of your diet and lifestyle choices right. than you would otherwise. How does that work? Yeah. Okay. So let's travel backwards in time. Uh, it's 2002. I get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes when I'm a senior in college. I'm trying to graduate from Stanford University just trying to move on with my life. And all of a sudden I get this diagnosis of type one. Okay. Now I was given two different types of insulin to start injecting and to, and then I was also given the prescription to eat a low carbohydrate diet. I didn't know anything about, about biology, nor did I know anything about nutrition. So I said, okay, great. Sounds like a plan. So I ate a low carbohydrate diet. And what I recognized was two things. Number one, the promise was that my glucose would be nice and flat and nice and controllable. Okay. Not even close. My glucose was a roller coaster. I wish I could have documented my blood glucose meter and showed you what happened, but my blood glucose values were doing this all day long. Up, down, up, down, up, down. And you know, when they went up, they didn't just go up to 150 or 160. They went up to 400, 290, 320, 400. I mean, I'm talking to the point where your wow. glucose is so high that it's hard to think straight. You're very thirsty. You get a headache. It's just, it's just not a fun place to be, right? Yeah. So that was happening to me frequently. And I found that even though the promise was that my glucose would be controllable, the second promise was that my insulin use would be kept nice and low. That did not happen either. My insulin use was creeping up. I started at 25 units a day. Then it became 28, 32, 36, 39, 42, 52. On Sundays, I injected 55 units of insulin a day. And I was frustrated. So... When I transitioned to a plant-based diet, because I was just looking for a healthier way to be, I found empirically that my blood glucose came down significantly. So rather than having high blood glucoses, all of a sudden my blood glucose was normalized within 24 hours. In addition to that, my insulin use went from being like an average of 45 units per day, all the way down to about 25 units per day. Okay. So I did some math in the background to try and figure out what actually was happening. And what I found was that the... On, a pre, on my previous diet, I ate 125 grams for approximately 45 units. So call that a three to one ratio. Three grams of carbohydrate per unit of insulin. On a new plant-based diet, I was eating 25 grams of carbohydrate per unit of insulin. So what I was, I was eating wow. hundreds of grams of carbohydrate for less insulin and no medical professional could even explain why this was happening until I had to dive into the research myself to try and figure it out. Okay. So um, that's that's pretty impressive. It's, it's obviously one person, but you did research and realized you're not just one person. Correct. This is actually, there's reasons why you had that experience, which play out for a whole lot of people. And how interesting that while at one level, conventional thinking is that type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes are completely different. And mm-hmm. in some respects, they are. In both cases, increasing your body's ability to be sensitive to insulin is a really good thing. Correct. And you do that by bringing down the excess fat in the tissues and triglycerides and other clogging components, right? 
That is exactly right. To, to oversimplify perhaps a bit. And is this why obesity is so linked to diabetes? Because when we're talking about fat, that's also one expression of fat in the tissues. Absolutely. There's no question about it. Yeah, there's a very strong association between people who are obese and people who are living with type 2 diabetes in particular. And it's not necessarily like a one-to-one -one relationship in that all people who are obese have type 2 diabetes or vice versa. But as a general statement, the more weight you gain, okay, anytime you're above your ideal body weight and you have excess weight on you, it places such a demanding metabolic load on your pancreas and that unto itself raises your biological requirement to manufacture and secrete insulin. In other words, when you're carrying excess body weight, you force your pancreas to work harder. And as your pancreas works harder and harder and harder and harder today and then next Tuesday and then next month and so on and so forth, over the course of two, three, four, five, ten 10 years, at a certain point, your pancreas can burn out and basically be like, you know what? I've been manufacturing excess insulin for a long time. I can't do this anymore. I don't have the metabolic machinery to do it anymore. I quit. And at that point, that's when type 2 diabetes can set in, right? So the simple, uh, one of the most effective ways to sort of reverse that process is to lose weight and to approach your ideal body weight. So let's say you have 50 excess pounds on you. If you went from 50 down to 20 excess pounds on you, boom, you're going to see a dramatic improvement in your blood glucose. If you go from 20 down to zero and you're at your ideal body weight, all of a sudden your glucose metabolism is likely to normalize and all of that can happen relatively quickly. Got it. Thank you. Uh, Dawn asked a question just going a little deeper on type one. She said, can diet heal the pancreas to the point where it starts producing insulin again? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, so that is, if, if that could happen, whoever does that and whoever figures out the science behind it will win the Nobel Prize. It's that, it's that important, right? So up to this point, no. There's, there's no scientific research that says eat this and regain insulin production. What the scientific research says is eat this and gain insulin sensitivity so that you can reduce your risk of other chronic diseases. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Linda said, your information in mastering diabetes has been inspirational for me, a pre-diabetic 74-year-old. I have taken one to two grams of cinnamon daily for 10 years with the hope of staving off full-blown type 2. So far, my highest A1C has been a brief stay at 6.3. Do you know if I'm just cheating the analysis protocol? Am I cheating the analysis protocol? So I guess is the question that by taking cinnamon somehow I have an advantage over other people? Is that what she's trying to I think she's asking about that. And then maybe if her highest A1C has been a brief stay at 6.3, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how's she doing? <laughs> I kept okay, saying. got it. Okay, so this is a great question. So um, let's talk A1C here for a brief second. Um, and A1C is basically a measurement of your three month, three month average blood glucose, okay? So Ocean, if I go measure your A1C, what I want is because you're non-diabetic, I want to keep you in that range. That would mean that your A1C value is, is less than 5.7%, okay? If your A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4, that puts you in the pre-diabetes range. And if you're 6.5 or greater, that puts you in the type two range. So she's saying my highest A1C is 6.3. That's why she was diagnosed with pre-diabetes because she's in that range. Now, as far as uh, cinnamon is concerned, there's actually two types of cinnamon. One of them has effects on your blood glucose. One of them doesn't. The type of cinnamon that most of us get in the grocery store is called cassia cinnamon. Cassia cinnamon is just widely available. It's very inexpensive. It doesn't do anything for blood glucose management. The type of cinnamon that actually can reduce your blood glucose is called Ceylon cinnamon. That's much more expensive. It's harder to find. Uh, and that's a metabolically active uh, version of cinnamon. So if you can get your hands on Ceylon cinnamon, having a small amount of that on a daily basis can make an, a significant impact. And there's actually another plant called umla berries, which are Indian gooseberries, that are one of the most powerful cholesterol-reducing foods and blood glucose-reducing foods that the world has ever discovered. So we are huge proponents of that and educate people about why they want to integrate that into their lifestyle. But if your A1C is 6.3 or less and you have a little bit of cinnamon, hopefully Ceylon cinnamon, you're doing a great job. And if you can get that even lower than 5.7%, then you're going to be in the most uh, metabolically beneficial situation possible. Thank you. Um, Cyrus, apart from the sort of 
broad notion that excess fat can fuel uh, insulin resistance. Um, is there, um, let's get a little more nuanced here. Are there specific compounds or nutrients like you just mentioned, the Ceylon cinnamon that help to increase insulin sensitivity in the cells or that help to clear away uh, triglycerides or fat that might be clogging the works? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a great question. So yeah, there's there's a whole collection of medicinal plants that, that have a significant impact on reducing your blood glucose. Yeah? Now, some of these plants can help liberate uh, the, the fatty acids that are inside of your liver and muscle. Some of them don't. Okay. So it would take us, you know, many hours to go into the biological mechanisms of each one of them. And it's not even worth it. But for the purposes of this discussion, what I would say is that if I had to sort of like come up with a list of the medicinal plants that are very powerful at reducing your blood glucose, the first one would be umla berries. Like we talked about Indian gooseberries. Okay. The second one is going to be uh, another food called bitter melon. And bitter melon, as the name indicates, is extremely bitter, as are umla berries. Like so bitter that it's almost, uh, it's almost nauseating. Okay? And this is, uh, you can get it at a Chinese grocery store. Sometimes you can get it at Latin grocery stores. Uh, and um, when you have small amounts of this bitter melon, what it can do is it can actually help lower your blood glucose within hours um, of eating it. Okay, So you can have a, a meal that contains a significant amount of carbohydrate and you have the bitter melon inside of that same meal and your blood glucose is nice and stable. The third food that I would highly recommend trying to find a way to get into, into your body is called berberine. And berberine is, uh, again, ex almost impossible to eat by itself because it, is, it, is, it kind of initiates a gag reflex, but you can get it inside of little pills. And these pills, you, you, know, you just consume them and they are metabolically after to help lower your blood glucose as well. So any of those are good additions. There's a whole another laundry list of other medicinal plants that have very powerful metabolic activity as well. But those are the three that we start with it to, to, to begin with. Thank you. Um, and uh, obviously when we talk about fat buildup in the muscles and in the cells, we're, we're talking about excess fat, but are all fats created equal? Is saturated fat more impactful? And are omega-3 fatty acids less impactful? Or are you sort of putting all fats in the same category? Great question. Phenomenal question. Uh, there's definitely differences in the type of fat that you consume, okay? So I want you to think about it as though there's three different types. There's trans fat, saturated fat, unsaturated fat, okay? The trans fat is the type of fat that you find predominantly inside of packaged and processed foods that comes anytime you see the word hydrogenated vegetable oil, hydrogenated canola oil, partially hydrogenated something oil, any of those, uh, that's a source of trans fats. Okay. Now those trans fats, they, they're, they come in many different products that you might not even know. Okay. They come inside of, uh, pastries, cookies, crackers, chips. Um, sometimes they're in, um, mayonnaise. Sometimes they're in oils themselves. So you have to kind of be a little bit of a detective to try and figure out exactly where they're present. Okay. A simple thing you can do is to try and avoid eating packaged products as a whole, which is a generally a very good recommendation. Um, and that way you can effectively avoid trans fats in your, in your diet altogether. The reason why trans fats are problematic is because trans fats have been shown in the research to wreak havoc, absolute havoc on your vasculature. When you consume trans fats, it can increase your LDL cholesterol. It can damage the endothelial layer inside of your blood vessels all throughout your body. And trust me, you do not want to get any of those problems. Okay. That's the first one. The second one is saturated fat. Saturated fat is the type of fat that we talked about earlier. That's the type of fat that gets inside of your liver and muscle and causes insulin resistance. That's the type of fat that just happens to be very abundant inside of the animal world. Okay. So anytime you're consuming red meat, white meat, fish, chicken, dairy products, or eggs, you're eating predominantly saturated fat. That's where that comes from. You can also find saturated fat in the plant world. You can get it from oils. You can get it from avocados. You can get it from nuts and seeds. You can get it from coconuts. It's just uh, a little bit of saturated fat goes a long way. So what we generally recommend to people living with all forms of diabetes is to do your best to eliminate as many animal foods as possible. And if you choose to eat fat-rich plant-based foods like avocados, nuts, seeds, coconuts, and beyond, a little bit goes a long way. So just have a small amount of those foods and sprinkle them into your diet and keep your total saturated fat content nice and low. 
The third type of fat is unsaturated fat. And these unsaturated fatty acids are actually beneficial. They're beneficial for eye health. They're beneficial for brain health. They're beneficial for neurological health. And they're very anti-inflammatory. Now, um, these unsaturated fatty acids come predominantly from the plant world. What a coincidence, right? So if you, again, if you can increase your total plant food consumption, you're going to naturally increase your unsaturated fat content. You're going to naturally decrease your saturated fat content, and you're going to naturally eliminate your trans fat content. All three of those is exactly what you want. Yes, thank you. Quite true. I will say that uh, coconut oil is the most highly saturated uh, fat that we have in consumer use. Palm oil is in there as well, pretty high. Right. And so I do know some vegans who are loading up on the coconut oil, mm -hmm. and some of them are having concerning numbers with cholesterol and triglycerides and so forth, mm -hmm. especially if they also are having some, you know, white flour and, and some sugar in the mix, right? So Absolutely. a lot of people think, oh, I just cut out the animal products and I'm all good, but that it's not so simple. You could, right. junk food vegans have no great health advantage, although there obviously are benefits from avoiding some of the animal products, but then if you're replacing them with other things that are, you know, processed carbs or other forms of unhealthy saturated fat, it can, it can be a problem. So obviously, you know, the, the dose determines the poison, you know? <laughs> A, right. teaspoon, a teaspoon of anything edible is probably not going to kill you. You know, uh, you can have an ice cream cone once in a while and you're probably not going to die, uh, depending on your situation, of course. But, but uh, some things, there is a straw that can break a camel's back, but most straws aren't that straw. Um, however, uh, the reality is that uh, in general, you want to make food medicine. And this is, I think, one of the principles that you focus on and I also focus on is that Food is not just pleasure. It should be pleasurable, but fundamentally we wanna narrow the field and make sure that we're drawing pleasure from foods that actually nourish our well-being and our capacity to experience pleasure. We wanna fall in love with foods that love us back essentially. Otherwise we're in toxic relationships. And a lot of people are fundamentally addicted to foods that don't have their best interests at heart and they don't treat their bodies well. How do you deal with habit change, Cyrus? Any tips on that? Yeah, we do it real slowly. We do it real slowly. So I love the fact that you talk about food as medicine because you talk about that all over the Food Revolution Network website. It's very prominent. You talk about it in the Food Revolution Summit. We talk about it in the Blood Sugar Revolution Summit. We talk about it also uh, in the Mastering Diabetes ecosystem. There's no question. You want to eat the foods that can substitute for pharmaceutical medication when possible. And if you really think about food as being a medication, then it's a simple way to think about trying to eat foods that actually improve your overall metabolic health as opposed to foods that you know are going to force you to age faster and decrease your overall uh, metabolic health, right? Now, uh, the question that you asked was, one more time? Habit change. Habit change, thank you, right. So when it comes to habit change, we are sticklers about changing your habits slowly. Okay. Now, we know from having helped thousands of people through the habit change process that if you try and rush habit change, you could succeed in the short term, but you are likely to hit a roadblock somewhere along the way and get frustrated and then recognize that you didn't create a collection of sustainable habits. And as a result of that, life gets hard, life gets complicated, things get in the way, Thanksgiving shows up, wedding shows up, birthdays show up, and before you know it, now you're back to your old habits, okay? Yeah. So what we do is we teach people that if we're gonna, if I'm gonna try and change you from being a standard American dieter into a plant-based eater, okay? My time frame for that is six months, okay? And the way that we try and accomplish this is by saying, okay, Ocean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encourage you to change your breakfast. And I want you to change your breakfast and only that meal until you feel very comfortable with it, until you love the foods that you eat, until you know exactly how much to eat, until you feel very full and you feel the metabolic benefit of that food. Okay. It could take a week. It could take two weeks. It could take a month. I literally don't care. Whenever you are ready and you say, okay, Cyrus, I'm ready for step two, then we move on to changing your lunch. We repeat that process. Then we change on to moving your dinner. Then we change on to intermittent fasting. Then we change to multiple, then we change to exercise and so on and so forth. So if this process took you three months to six months, but you put in the time and effort to actually creating sustainable habits 
and being verbal about the fact that certain things are challenging and certain things you don't like, and you really worked through that process, then you're likely to develop sustainability such that two years from now, I could pick up the phone and I'd say, hey, Ocean, what are you eating for breakfast? And you could tell me exactly what I want to hear, right? Yeah. The problem I think with habit change is that um, it's very tempting to get excited about changing your diet and, and trying to reduce your medication needs and trying to lose weight. And unfortunately, the weight loss industry in particular has driven home this narrative that faster is better. Okay. You see this all over the place. You see people, you know, the advertising says, lose 20 pounds in 30 days, right? You know, fit into that bikini for summertime. And, and what it forces people to think is like, oh, I got to get this done fast. Because if I do it in the next three weeks, then everything's going to look, I'm going to look great and I'm going to feel great. But when you do that, you actually set yourself up for a lack of success. And then that can cause a yo-yo and that can cause you to get discouraged. And then over the course of time, you haven't created sustainability. So take your time. It's a marathon. Enjoy the process. And it's likely to unfold in your favor. All right. Thank you. You dropped one thing in there. You mentioned intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about that at all yet. So I just want to hear your take. What does that mean to you? Mm Because the words are thrown around quite uh, to mean a lot of different things. What does it mean to you and what does the science tell us about it? Great, great question. So when I was at UC Berkeley doing my PhD, uh, I got the opportunity to spend five years uh, delving into like everything related to intermittent fasting and calorie restriction to try and figure out what what does it mean and how is it actually applicable to human beings? And um, we learned hundreds of things at the time. One of the most important things that uh, I, we learned is that the, the term intermittent fasting refers to simply manipulating the timing of your food intake, okay? So I don't necessarily have to restrict how much food you're eating. All I'm looking to do is change the timing in which you put that food into your body, okay? So everybody has 24 hours in a day, okay? And you could choose to evenly space out your food and have a little bit for breakfast, a little bit for lunch, a little bit for dinner, have a little bit for snack, a little bit dessert, and then your your food intake is sort of distributed while you're awake. Or you could say, no, 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 no. I'm only going to eat within a, call it an eight hour window. And then the other 16 hours of the day, I'm going to be sleeping and fasting. Okay. Now what the research demonstrates is that two things. Number one, when you perform intermittent fasting, which again is manipulating the timing of your food intake, it's, it's common that manipulating the timing can can cause you to eat less food. So if you manipulate the timing and then that has a secondary effect of of, of reducing your appetite and uh, reducing your calorie intake, that can lead to a lot of metabolic health benefits. You can reduce your body weight, lower your blood glucose, lower your blood pressure, you name it, right? But let's just say that it didn't for whatever reason and you manipulated the timing, but you're still eating the same number of calories even in that situation you're still going to dramatically improve your metabolic health. So we are huge fans of intermittent fasting. And the the method that we try and educate people about that, again, is sustainable, is to try and perform a 16-8 intermittent fast on a daily basis. That's 16 hours of fasting, 8 hours of eating. So you choose any 8-hour window from the time you wake up, plus 8 hours, noon to 8 hours, whatever you want. You eat only during that window, and you fast the rest of the time, and you sleep. And when people do that, they get tremendous results. And oftentimes they feel like they, uh, they're they not deprived of calories. They actually feel great when they're fasting and they want to continue. Yeah. Awesome. I uh, tend to be an advocate for focusing more on light dinners than skipping breakfast in yeah. that direction and early dinners. It's nice to go to bed with a little bit of space in your tummy Uh, you'll sleep better. Your body doesn't have to work to digest while you're sleeping and your metabolic state will be more restful at that point. Um, And also it's better to consume calories when you're going to use them, which is while you're up and about. Consuming calories late at night is more likely to turn into fat on your body. Uh, Statistically, we burn more in the morning and in the daytime. So if you're going to skip something, I say go light on dinner or go early on dinner. And we tend, I, I tend to go that route. Like I have dinner like six or something. And then uh, that's it till maybe 10 the next morning, which is pretty much what you're saying, actually. That's a, that's a 16 hour break. Correct. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. 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 I, I'm a huge fan of exactly what you just described. There, there's this, uh, there's this like 
riddle. It says something like, eat breakfast like a king, eat lunch like a prince, and eat dinner like a pauper or something like that. That's right. That's Michael Pollan said that. Yep. Michael Pollan. Yeah, there you go. So it's like you're decreasing your food intake over the course of time. And that that's a that's leads to phenomenal results, no question. Yeah, fabulous. Okay, got a couple questions here from Thomas. Mm-hmm. He uh, and this is referring to some of your recommendations, I think. He said, How much amala powder is required to get four grams? Mm-hmm. Will one teaspoon do it? Mm-hmm. And he went on to say, I'm taking a one tablespoon mix of matcha green tea, amala powder, and psyllium husk powder every morning in an eight-ounce shaker cup of water with ice cubes getting very specific here. He said, I make the powder myself by volume. Tastes terrible, but a squirt of orange or mango peach flavoring makes it reasonable. Mm-hmm. At 72, I do what I want when I want and for as long as I want. I do not want to screw that up. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. So his original question is, how much amla powder do I have to take in order to get approximately four grams of berries? All right. Yeah. Now, the reason why four grams of berries is important is because Uh, Some of the research that actually Dr. Greger had uh, shown me back in the day was that uh, amla berries were compared head to head versus a diabetes medication known as glimepiride. And what the research showed was that over a 21 day period, if you consume three grams of amla berries per day, it's equivalent to glimepiride in terms of its blood glucose lowering ability. And um, so the number four is basically just a slightly larger therapeutic dose of amla berries per day. Now, Full disclosure here, we have a sister company called Amla Green, which is basically uh, Amla Berries uh, as a tea powder that you mix into hot water and drink as a tea that actually tastes good. So what we do is one scoop equals four grams of berries. And so we've specifically formulated it to be that strong. But if you go buy an Amla powder directly from Amazon and buy it from some other supplier, I have no idea what the strength of that powder is. So You could put one tablespoon and say, I'm using one tablespoon. Is that four grams of berries? And my answer to you is, I don't know. I didn't make those products, right? So it sort of depends on which particular product you're using. But if you can try and figure that out from the manufacturer, that would be my recommendation. Got it. Thank you. And uh, psyllium husk powder, matcha green tea, are these things you're also encouraging people to uh, utilize? Yeah. So matcha green tea is something that's actually, you, you just sent an email about it not too long ago about just how powerful matcha is. So matcha is one of the most powerful antioxidant rich substances humans have ever discovered. Amla berry is actually the number one and matcha is actually not too far behind that. So should you include matcha in your, uh, in your daily activities? My answer would be absolutely by all stretch of the imagination. No, no question. Psyllium husk powder is actually not one of my preferred. The reason why people you are, are told to consume psyllium husk powder is because the fiber content of their diet is generally low. So rather than consuming psyllium husk powder to add fiber and add roughage to your digestive system to try and clear out any of the accumulated material, what I would recommend doing is increasing your fiber content from the food that you're consuming. When you do that and you don't eat 30 grams of fiber per day, but you eat 70 grams of fiber per day or more, then you're going to find that your need for any of these other fiber additives completely goes away. Thank you very much. Um, Another question from Thomas here. Mm -hmm. He said, I like and often make planta burgers, which taste good and have lots of beans. However, I do like the texture of the DIY Impossible Burger Mm 2.0, and its flavor is very good as well. What is your opinion on using textured vegetable protein? TVP, mm-hmm. which is called out in the DIY, but not in the planta. I grill them on a silicon pad and freeze extras for quick and yummy meals later on. Mm-hmm. Is TVP too processed to be healthy? You know, I'm going to actually defer this one to you. I, I do not know what TVP is actually made out of. Do you, do you happen to so, know? So it's also, it's, it's a soy product. It's, it's, it's isolated soy product. protein. So, uh, you know, we've got a couple issues with soy. One is that it's often genetically engineered right. and some people have concerns about glyphosate contamination and other issues with GMOs. So if it's not organic or certified non-GMO, then it's almost certainly genetically engineered because 95% of the crop in the U.S. soy crop is GMO. But there is non-GMO certified and there is organic TVP. So that's a slightly different equation. In general, um, the data is kind of mixed on the health effects of soy protein isolates. It's very positive, overwhelmingly so, about soy in general. And there are some studies showing that soy protein 
uh, has been beneficial for some people in terms of health outcome. But there are also concerns. It is a processed product. And um, we don't know if those benefits are just because it's replacing meat products, which have their own downsides, or whether it's actually a healthy food. And I could say that uh, probably bean burgers are going to be healthier than TVP burgers. Here's the thing. You don't want to make the perfect into the enemy of the good. So right. if you're making a transition and you're taking that one step at a time, like Cyrus says, start with breakfast, for example, and get that down before you move on to lunch. Similarly, if you're transitioning away from you know, Big Macs and you're wanting to move in a healthier direction, then for some people, you know, the process, more processed kinds of meat substitutes can be a useful stepping stone on the journey, but they're not going to get you to optimal health. And so there's little doubt that soy is a tremendously helpful and that beans of all kinds for most people are tremendously healthy. With TVP, a little more murky. There's some data showing it may be helpful. There's also some uncertainty about its impact on hormonal balance. So uh, my bottom line is, again, as a step on the journey, sure, have some fun. You know, a little bit of TVP in your bean chili is not going to kill you. It's probably going to help and might improve your social life. If you're making dinner for a bunch of meat eaters over Thanksgiving, it may be the difference between them loving your meal and not. So go for it, you know, in general. But for basing your diet around these things, you want to think of food as medicine. And if food is medicine, then you start with what's really going to help you thrive. And even if that narrows the palette a little bit, you work with the colors you've got and find out how to make a beautiful painting with them. Brilliant. Look at that. I, I learned something in the process here. Uh, I'm going to go read up about TVP a little bit more, but that was a phenomenal answer. Thank you. All right. So Cyrus, we're just about out of time here. Any final thoughts about blood sugar, about health, and uh, anything else you want to share with our audience before we wrap here today? Definitely. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I appreciate it. Um, the one thing that I, the, the sort of take home message here is I would encourage people to really start to question this idea that carbs are bad for you, okay? Um, just like sugar is thrown around as a term that confuses people, the term carb also confuses people, okay? A lot of people say, I'm eating a low carb diet and because of that, I feel great. In reality, what they are trying to say is I am eliminating processed and refined carbohydrates from my diet. And by doing so, they're going to dramatically improve their overall health, okay? The carbohydrates are phenomenal fuel sources. Carbohydrates break down into glucose and fructose, and both of those are fuel for your liver, for your muscle, for your brain, and for all tissues. So rather than saying, I'm going to avoid carbohydrates, what I encourage you to do is try and migrate away from refined carbohydrates and to migrate towards whole carbohydrates from fruits, from vegetables, from legumes, and from whole grains. If you can base your diet around just those four calorie sources, you will likely find that your metabolic health improves dramatically, that you're able to lose weight without even trying, and that this thing called insulin resistance and diabetes can kind of fade away into the background, and your overall metabolic health will improve in ways that you may not have even thought was possible. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, bonus, it's good for your brain. It's good for your heart. It's good for your vitality and your joy. And, you know, I think there's a lot more pleasure to be had in uh, feeling good, <laughs> in being able to play and run and, and dance and celebrate and do the things you were born to do with a clear mind and a full heart and a healthy body than there is in short term, uh, you know, flavor hits that degrade your self-respect and your wellness. Correct. So, you know, Cyrus, you are uh, opening a pathway for so many people to reclaim their health and their lives. So many people suffering from all the different forms of diabetes, all six of them feel hopeless, feel lost, feel like they're just on a one-way path to more and more suffering. And the truth is a lot of these things are vicious circles. They're negative feedback loops where when you feel bad, you're more likely to be drawn to unhealthy foods. When you're overweight, you're less likely to exercise and you're more likely to have more insulin resistance, which in turn may fuel cycles that end up with you putting on more pounds. So 
what, what you're showing is really another path to freedom, to vitality and to joy. And I thank you for it. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ocean. I consider you to be uh, one of my one of my uh, one of my role models in life. Even though I may have never told you that before, but the way that you communicate uh, inspiration and health through positivity is truly inspiring. So I thank you. And uh, you know, if anybody here feels like their health is out of control and they're too old or they're too diseased to make a difference, I strongly encourage you to understand that as long as you're alive, you can likely make a significant positive impact in your diet, in your lifestyle, simply by choosing the right foods. And when you do, you're likely to feel it, you're likely to see it, and you can live in a way that you didn't even think was possible. So thank you so much. Yes, you can. Cyrus, thank you. And by the way, everybody watching, if you haven't already got a copy of Mastering Diabetes, check it out. It is fantastic. And it's also a bestseller and there's a good reason why. Uh, again, thanks so much for joining us. We wish you health and vitality and lots of good food and lots of healthy, balanced blood sugar for many vibrant years to come. Thank you. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for Whole Life Club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.